The Hog's Die is brought to you by TicketClub.com, your one-stop shop for live events nationwide. Whether you're looking for game, theater, or live performance tickets, don't sweat it. TicketClub.com has you covered. So make sure you're going there for all your live entertainment needs, and make sure you're clicking over to them from the banner at the top of thehogsdie.com. And welcome back to the Hogstye, everybody. It is a limited crew. Uh, I'm Steve, of course. Jamal is with us. And Alex is out gallivanting around in, on vacation this week. Sean is out. But we have somebody far more important with us today. And that is our <laughs> friend and uh, longtime friend of the show, Mark Bullock from The Athletic. How are you, Mark? Oh, I'm good, thanks. How are you guys doing? Doing very I'm good. Doing all right. You're doing all right too. Now, now, um, Mark, you know, we tried to get you to do this show a few weeks ago, and I was so proud of you in that you said no because, you know, you were basically tired of us dragging you, you know, out of bed at three in the morning. So I was proud uh, yeah. of you. Yeah, you put well, your foot I mean, down, man. It, it was more just that that was the one week where I'd sorted out a sleeping pattern. So I was like. <laughs> Uh, I normally I would have been fine, uh, but I was like the season's hmm. over. I sorted out a sleeping pattern. I don't want to get up at three a.m. to do a podcast. But, <laughs> you know, uh, I, see, I would have told us to get bent a long time ago if I were you. So I'm really <laughs> glad to see you, you bone, you know, backboned up to us. Um, <laughs> okay, well, see, we have a whole bunch to talk to you about um, this year. You know, we're sort of in the dead zone for news. Not that much is going on with the Redskins, but. Where we'd like to start is we'd like to uh, run through some uh, position groups and get your thoughts on various players and where the Redskins are doing and whatnot. We'll start with quarterback. Yep. So here's where I'd like to go with quarterback. Um, right now we have a very injured Alex Smith, and we're just going to assume he's down for the count for the time being. So we've basically got Colt McCoy and nobody. So number one, are you? how do you feel about Colt McCoy potentially starting next year? Um iffy uh I, I i like colt mccoy I, I think he's fine um i think he's someone that you can have start games i think he can be a guy that can be a bridge to a younger quarterback um the question with colt mccoy has always been can he stay healthy and throughout his career he's proved that he cannot um so i think if you're rolling with colt mccoy you better have either another backup in sort of like a josh johnson type that they they're familiar with um, or go get a rookie, um, go draft a guy that um, sh- should be ready to play sooner rather than later because we- we've seen from Colt McCoy, he-, he just struggles to last more than a couple games before he gets hurt. So if, you- if you're going to go down that route, that's fine, but you got to have you need to have a plan B and possibly a plan C. You could possibly go with both of those options. You could, you could quite easily sign Josh Johnson as the backup and have your rookie there ready to go as well um, because, you know, he, he's just proven time and time again that he, he can't stay healthy for more than a couple games. Well, let's talk – let's do go, – go ahead, Jamal. I'm sorry. I cut you off. No, that's fine. So, uh, so with that being said, um, just to – I would say keeping the financial situation in mind, knowing that Colt McCoy is who he is, you know you're going to need at least another veteran – uh, on this roster 
they're in negotiations with Josh Johnson, or well, he's on in contract until under contract until I think March or something like that, or it's April. The, it's the end um, of the league year in the, yeah. is, which is early March. So okay, so with that being said, uh, what is more likely um, a more likely scenario uh, in your opinion? Do you do you think if negotiations go well, then that's one thing, but is Josh Johnson the appropriate backup for uh, this just to be on this team or is there other options that you can consider knowing that this is a, a, a big season for Jay Gruden do you think that we need to get a, a, a more uh, respectable or more experienced um, or proven quarterback in the NFL like via free agency uh, to, to potentially back up Cole McCord or push him as a starter um, come, come 2019 I think the more likely option is that they go with Johnson um, as McCoy's backup and they look to draft someone. Um, and that could be a high first round pick and they could be that could be a guy that they that they start sooner rather than later. I, I would assume given the financials, I would assume that's the more likely option. Um, if, if you wanted to go free agency and sign a quarterback, that is certainly an option. Um, but you're looking at guys. That, I, mean, I mean, we've seen the quarterback market over the past few years just explode, and a, a one-year deal, even a one-year deal for a quarterback, is going to be expensive. Yeah. Um, so you could potentially look at Teddy Bridgewater um, is a guy I like. You could look at Tyra Taylor. Um, I I don't think you'd be trading for Andy Dalton, but if he became free, he'd obviously be a natural fit with Jay Gruden. Um, you, you could look at Ryan Tannehill as a guy that intrigues me a little bit, but again, you'd have to wait for the Dolphins to leave him. him home, yeah. Um, yeah, let him go. So um, th those are some guys that are, are names that would obviously fit, um, uh, but they're all going to be far more costly. And, and you're looking at, I, I would imagine for most of those, more than sort of $10 million for the season. Yeah, um, I think we couldn't afford any of those guys, frankly. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're looking at, I think, maybe Ryan Fitzpatrick. Yeah, and and that, if you're looking at a Fitzpatrick or a Josh McCown, that kind of route, you, you're probably thinking you might as well go with McCoy and Johnson and a rookie. Um, yeah, at it, least they it, know the team. Can you, can you go over a little bit of the X's and O's of what you saw in Josh Johnson's play last year? You know, he's a great story. He tailed off from a statistical numbers wise, you know, kind of as the games went on. But you know, by the end of the game, the end of the year, we were playing with like, you know, an arena league roster practically. Yeah. yeah. So what did you see from an X's and O's standpoint from Josh Johnson? Uh, I thought he was pretty good. Um, I, I thought he, the best game he played was when he came in off the bench, um, and uh, on on his first game, and he made some throws in that game that made me stand up and go, "Wow, that's a guy that." Why has he not been starting? Why why did it take so long to get him in instead of Mark Sanchez? Um, and and I, I think what Johnson forced them to do more than anything else was he gave them he made them be a little bit more creative um, with with their offense and and I think we saw a little bit more of an influence from Kevin O'Connell um, and and we saw some of the pistol stuff with the read option um, and using Johnson's ability as a runner in as a threat in the run game and that evens up the numbers against defense um and that helps in that aspect and that builds up stuff off play action um and we saw some different packages where that we hadn't seen all season the stuff with uh byron marshall chris thompson he had the two back packages which um and and to be fair to them like neither of those guys have been healthy for most of the year so they couldn't necessarily have gotten to those two with that package until they did but once Johnson came in, we saw that package, and and it looked effective. So, um, and it looks like something they could run next year potentially with with Thompson and and, and Geis. So, um, yeah, I think you you could see a a real game plan, and not just like one or two plays. You could see a a flow of a game plan. You could see it weaving from this play to this play to this play, and it sort of all knitted together nicely, as opposed to just being right, we're going to run this play, and we're going to run this play, and we're going to run this play, and it doesn't really mesh. You can see it mesh better with, with, with Johnson. Particularly uh, if he has a whole off season to get involved, you know, in game in uh, the offense and whatnot. Yeah. Um, can you go back – let's go back to Colt McCoy. You know, because I would assume probably he's going to be our week one starter. Um, what do you think from an X's and O's standpoint that Colt McCoy will bring that Alex Smith didn't bring – 
or what what are the differences that we can expect to see in the offense as opposed to what we saw last year when the team was healthy? Well, Colt's going to sling it. He's not going to worry about, you know, being conservative. And, and there was certainly uh, something to Alex Smith being a little bit more conservative and not turning the ball over. And, you know, I mean, you, you saw the the team was somewhat frustrating, but, you know, they, they won games. They were 6-3, and three, um, and it was working for them. And there, there was a confidence in the team with Alex Smith at quarterback. But with Colt McCoy at quarterback, we saw instantly the receivers start making plays. You saw Jordan Reed get involved, and, and you saw McCoy putting up balls, trusting his guys to go make plays. Josh, Don, uh, Josh Doxon went and made some big catches the moment McCoy stepped in. So McCoy's going to give his guys opportunities. Um, and, and It's a, a comparison that I don't want to make because of the, the, the name, but Rex Grossman, <laughs> when he was here, used to do a similar thing where he was... I'm gonna. I I know where I'm meant to go with this ball. It's meant to be thrown to this spot at this point, and I'm gonna trust my guy to be there. And the, uh, it, it can result in interceptions, but it, it, uh, receivers quite often like that because it means that they're being trusted to go make plays. And yeah, I think that's and, something McCoy did. And and that's the thing. I, I to be honest with you, I've never like public publicly stated that, but it's it's it, I I wouldn't even be ashamed of that comparison at all. It's 100 percent accurate in the sense that. It didn't matter back then. It didn't matter for the receivers in terms of, you know, all right, he's going he's going to throw a few turnovers, and these, these passes are going to look ugly. Like, why the hell did you make those decisions? But Rex Grossman was fearless when he got on the uh, when he was when he was a starter for Washington. It was never the, it was never the case that you knew he was going to come in and John Beckett. It, it was yeah. never going to be that situation. <laughs> so when Colt McCoy came in, these these receivers had these type this this type of confidence that made so many people like it's it's a elevated boost in the offense. It didn't matter. I mean, clearly you want points, but you can see like there's a different transformation in terms of how the the receivers and how the offense is playing. And just not saying it was a big difference, but at the same time, it was just still noticeable in terms of a slight boost. But my my question. Given that uh, O'Connell kind of made a more significant impact since the, I think the Philadelphia game, uh, I would assume that there's, uh, at that point on, there was a little bit more influence from him uh, the rest of the season. I would like to know if if you had a uh, an opinion on this, how what is your confidence level in terms of the relationship between O'Connell and uh, uh, Colt McCoy moving forward? Like, what is your confidence level that this offense can be? Uh, at least more consistent uh, in terms of being able to pass the ball and, and, and run it on a balanced level effectively. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think what McCoy gives you from having that sort of fearless gunslinger attitude is it will give you more explosive plays. That's just the nature of it. There'll be more plays, and that, that goes either way. There'll be more interceptions, but there'll be more 30, 40-yard, 50-yard bombs. Uh, it will just be more explosive both ways. Whereas the offense that they had with Alex Smith was a lot more methodical. It was, you know, dink and dunk the ball, move it down the field, run the ball well, uh, involve him in the RPOs and the read option stuff, and and that will help the run game. And it would be slow, it would consume the clock, it would keep the defense fresh. And, I mean, that it was a very old-school style of football, but it clearly worked. Whereas uh, McCoy's just natural play style is going to be more explosive, more aggressive, and it's going to create bigger plays. As as we saw when he came in off the bench for Smith, he instantly threw a touchdown to uh, Jordan Reed, and he and he had a couple of bigger plays after that. Um, but then when we saw like a few games later, he he had a, what was it against the Cowboys? He had a yeah. terrible interception trying to hit Trey Quinn on a wheel route. Like that ball was never there, but he was still trying to fit it in there. So there's those are the two sides of the coin, and I I think. I, I don't think Kevin O'Connell or Jake Gruden or whoever is going to be calling the plays is going to have any issue with Colt McCoy under center. I think the key for them will be to be adapting to, yes, McCoy is going to be more aggressive. And I think Jake Gruden certainly likes that in a quarterback. And Jake Gruden's happy for the quarterback to create turnovers if they're going to negate it with explosive plays. Um we 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 get to really get into exactly what Kevin O'Connell's play uh, call style is like, so it, it's tough to say exactly how he'll mesh with McCoy. Um, but I think Jay Gruden will be okay with McCoy being that aggressive 
um, assuming that the interceptions don't make him regress and, and he doesn't get bothered by the interceptions and he keeps trying to put that ball out there and try to make those explosive plays. Yeah, well, first of all, and we're going to move on here uh, for time-wise, but first of all, both of you guys have now brought back the memory of Rex Grossman, and I think half <laughs> our listeners have thrown their <laughs> headphones across the room, so I'd like to thank you for that. Um, okay, well, let, let's talk some running back here. From, from, from my perspective, last year – um, we saw Adrian Peterson bring something to the table from the running back that we that we ha- that we haven't seen in years. You know, I, I you know, we had he he's even though he's old, you know, he's he's older than dirt by running back standards. To me, he still had his agility. He had vision like nobody else we've seen, uh, you know, in a long time around here. And he defied Father Time. You know, there's no doubt. Should we bring Adrian Peterson back? Uh, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't. Um, at this point, uh, like the only reasons you wouldn't have brought him back would uh, would have been the reasons you wouldn't have signed him in the first place. Whether you thought he was past it, or whether you were worried about the the stuff with his kids, or any of that kind of stuff. But they, they obviously didn't care about any of that because they signed him and they thought he was still good, and he proved to be still good on the field. So, um, yeah, I, I don't see why they wouldn't bring him back. Um, Geis is the future. I, I don't think there's any question about that. But he's coming off an ACL. He's already been injured in college a number of times. Hey, Martin, um, can I stop you right there real fast sure. about Geis? Um, what did you see from him on film in college? He, well, I absolutely loved Geis on film. I, I think I've said on this podcast before, He, I would have been happy with him at 13 last year when they drafted um, the defensive tackle. Uh, what's his name? Payne. Pain. 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 There we go. Yeah. I don't know why I forgot that. Uh, <laughs> when they drafted Payne, I, I said I'd be more than happy with Geis at 13. That's how highly I rated him. Um, he, he's an explosive runner. He does not go down on contact. Uh, he is an excellent, excellent zone runner. He he has such a great feel for zone runs. Um, and And what I mean by that is that there are people that will read zone runs where you can see it's mechanical. They're, they're deliberately reading a guy then moving on to the next read and it's slow and it's methodical whereas Geis has a natural feel for it he will just glide into his read he will um, press the hole and create those cutback lanes for himself to cut back into and uh, as those zone runs are known for so he is a terrific terrific running back um, so I, I think he, he will be the future of this team assuming he can stay healthy but um to go back to the Peterson question, there's no reason you wouldn't bring back Peterson to give him a, a lighter workload and, and ease him back into things. Um, you, you, uh, I think there's a fair split to be had between those two with Peterson getting on. Um, yes, he continues to defy you know, logic with his athleticism and at his age, but th- th- you want to protect that at the same time. You don't want to be giving him 30 carries a game for the first eight weeks and then have him slow down towards the end of the season and at the same time you don't want guys to be doing that with coming off his injury so I think you can find a blend there between those two and then you can still have Thompson or Byron Marshall or whoever on third down yeah so my let me let me ask you uh this question and see see if this is fair to you um now first we have we're in we're in the middle of negotiations or the Redskins are I'm not a part of them. I'm not. I don't know why I'm saying we, but they're in the they're in the middle of negotiations with Adrian Peterson um, right now. So given that there's no guarantee that he's coming back just yet, um, we have for the moment we have Darius Geis, Chris Thompson, uh, and a few other people: Samaj P. Ryan, Kelly, and uh, Marshall uh, and Marshall on the roster. Um, now, as you take a look at that depth chart, that position period. Um, there's really only this is excluding Adrian Peterson because he's currently we're assuming that you know he's not on the team right now. But mm-hmm. you have you have you have Geis and you have Thompson, and then after that, then you you really have nobody else. My question to you, or to see if this is fair, is what sh- should keep the Redskins from not pursuing another running back via I mean in the offseason period via free agency via draft. What should keep the Redskins from doing that, given that there is no clear, uh, no clear talent um, on, or it's not, it's not filled the way that it should be. It's not like a strong, a strong position group as, as it stands, given that Geis is coming off an injury. Uh, Chris Thompson is uh, a person who has been proven throughout his career, unfortunately, 
to be injury prone. As much as we like that 2017 season, yeah. uh, that you know it. It was only it was a short glimpse of what he can provide for this team, but I mean he still got hurt towards the end of the year. Uh, what what's is to stop the Redskins from going after uh, potential replacements for Chris Thompson, or just filling out the depth chart and making it as strong as possible? Given that a lot of teams run three running back sets nowadays, there's a lot of there's a lot of teams that use three running backs, uh, maybe even four, depending on the situation and how like their usage. But I mean, what is what is to stop the Redskins from doing it? Uh, I would disagree slightly in that I don't think it's a, a weak position for them. Um, I, I, I think your your guys like Rob Kelly and some RJ Ryan are just guys. I think, um, yeah. and and maybe maybe they like P Ryan a little bit more, uh, and because he was a draft pick, they give him a little bit more of a chance. Um, but I I I wasn't terribly high on P Ryan after his rookie year, um, and. I, we didn't really see anything from him last year, but that doesn't mean that they'll give up on him. Um, Rob Kelly, I'm iffy on. I, I, I would imagine he'll be the guy that they move on from if if they get Peterson back. Um, Thompson and Geiser, they're two guys. If they add Adrian Peterson, that's their three. They really seem to like Byron Marshall, um, and I can see the potential there. I think. Yeah, I can see it, and, and it's just it's rough. Like potential is kind of used. Not you. It's just used loosely because we can sure. we can see it, but it's like when is it ever going to come to fruition? They picked him over get over uh, Capri Bibbs, which surprised me. Yeah, that also surprised me because I thought Capri Bibbs was the yeah, better agree. running back out of the two. Um, and but clearly that kind of shows just how much they how highly they think of Marshall. And I think what they like of Marshall is that they feel he can split out wide and do some of the receiving stuff. Because he was, it, correct me if I'm wrong. I think he was a, a wide receiver and a running back in college. I think yeah. he played both spots. I think he did too. Yeah, I yeah. think he's a pretty versatile guy. So I think he's someone that they like as that kind of an option to split out wide. Um, and and that's what we saw towards the end of the year when both Marshall and Thompson were healthy and Josh Johnson was in. They would have both guys on the field and they would move both guys around and that would give def- defenses nightmares because. You have this two-back personnel, so defenses want to go in base personnel, and then suddenly you split both guys wide. You have an empty backfield against a base personnel, and you're getting someone matched up on a linebacker they can't cover, um, and, and that gives you an advantage. And I think that's the kind of thing that they like from Byron Marshall. Um, so I, I, yeah, I agree with you. At some point, the potential for him does need to be fulfilled, but I, I think they're going to give him the opportunity to fulfill that and I I I would be surprised if they made a, any sort of significant move for a running back bar, you know, an undrafted free agent or some free agent after the draft that they could come in and, you know, give some reps in camp. Yeah, I mean Elijah Wellman feels very disrespected right now that we haven't talked about him, but um I I I think to me the 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 major question is whether Darius Geis is going to have all of his all of his athleticism and agility back when he comes back from his ACL you know we've seen him sprinting we haven't seen him cutting which isn't so that surprising um you know it's great that he ran a 40 you know on film but that doesn't really tell us anything in terms of really where he is so that's my fear um is that so that's why I personally I think you bring Adrian Peterson back if nothing else is a hedge against Geis's ability to be Darius Geis again I agree I think that's what I think that's the most sensible route is that you get you get Peterson back with guys. You you give them a blend to keep them both healthy, um, and and then kind of play it by ear as the season goes on. If guys is showing his athleticism, you give guys more carries. If not, you give Peterson more carries, and you kind of go that route. Um, yeah, let's talk some wide receivers. Did you have another running back question, Jamal? I was just gonna say, I, I, I no, it, it was a comment, but I, I kind of I understand, and I think the good thing is, so like I, what I do, what I was doing the past couple of weeks I uh, was looking at some running backs uh, in the draft and I just felt like you know there is potential for replacements um, or more so not even replacements but just people to pr- provide more competition and, and, and pop, pop possibly bolster the, the, the depth chart uh, completely but I, the good thing is uh, running backs come out every year so yep. even if it's not this year um, you know you can always find one next year but uh, you know, you never want to miss out on opportunities where you can provide that explosion or or big play potential when you know there are 
uh, options coming out. So I just feel like you're not going to get that much outside of guys because I like the first preseason game. So you could see it. Like few few carries he had, he almost broke. A, he wrote, he almost broke two or three of them. So yeah. um, you know, it's it's is I would never shy away from that opportunity, especially for an offense where um you lack playmakers already. But it is what it is. You know, come out. Uh, they'll come out next year too. Yep. Um. Okay. So. The wide receiver group, we've got Josh Doxson in kind of a cast of thousands, so to speak, on here. Um, I'm not that high on Josh Doxson. Uh, certainly the fan base isn't. Um, to me, what you see is a guy who can't separate very well, who is weirdly athletic, but yet doesn't use his, uh, his athleticism as well as he should. Um, you know, so that... I don't think he's been worth the number one pick, and I don't think he has the potential to be a number one wide receiver. Certainly, this is the major question mark in the wide receiver group. So, Josh Doxson, opinion, go. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I'm. I don't want to do the kind of sitting on the fence thing, but I. I think I'm about to. Um, it's I, okay, man. Sit away. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the annoying thing is, I think I said on this podcast, or certainly a podcast, at the start of the year. That if this season Josh Doxson didn't prove that he could be a guy, then it was time to move on. I think you did and, tell us that. I think that was us. Yeah, I, yep. I think I'm pretty sure it was. Um, and this year, I don't think he did prove he was a guy. But yeah, you're going to backtrack. <laughs> but I'm backtracking slightly. As the year went on, I did see progression from him. Um, one of the biggest complaints, as you say, was separation. He doesn't. Or at the start of this year, he did not deal with physicality very well. Anyone that tried to bump him at the line of scrimmage would easily knock him off routes, and that was him dead. And and they'd have to move on to the next read instantly. As the year went on, though, we saw him get more physical in routes. We saw him fight with defensive backs. We saw him break tackles after making catches. We saw him make contested catches that weren't just the ridiculous jump ball catches. We saw him make the contested catch. Of I think it was against the Giants um, when they were backed up. They they ran that little play action, quick post, whatever you want to call it, um, and he he made a tough contested catch. I think it was against Jenkins, um, and he he start, started to make more of those plays. Now with with the the question I have with the, the receiver group as a whole, I I actually quite like a lot of the guys that they have. I I, I I I know I feel like here. I feel like I'm probably on an island with this. I quite like a lot of the guys they have. The question is the number one exposition. Whether you think Doxon can be that guy, then you you I I feel like you're set at that, at, at receiver because I thought Paul Richardson was really good, even though we didn't see it in production. I thought he was really good. He was getting open. He was taking the top off the defense. He was making plays even on short underneath passes, and he was making some good catches from some, quite frankly, bad passes from Smith. Um, and he was playing hurt throughout all of that. Um, I think Paul Richardson will come good. Trey Quinn it obviously proved well in the few chances he got in the slot. Um, whether they bring back Crowder or not, I would certainly be in favor of bringing back Crowder. I'm higher on Crowder than most. I think he's one of the better slot receivers in the league. Um, and I, I think he should be a priority to bring his back. numbers prove it you know no matter what anybody thinks is statistically he's produced like one of the top slot receivers in football yes um and the way they run their offense uh if, if they're not running the choice routes to jordan reed they're running the choice routes to jameson crowder so um I, I, he's crucial in my opinion and and they should bring him back but if they decide that, hey, we drafted Trey Quinn for a reason, we think he can be the slot, we don't have enough money with the cap stuff and the Alex Smith stuff, and they move on from him, I think you could probably get away with Trey Quinn as your slot receiver. Um, and then you have the depth guys. They like Robert Davis. Cam Sims showed up nicely. I think they can, have... can I stop right there with Sims? Sure. I, I thought Sims showed an awful lot in the preseason, and I thought he was basically yeah. ignored and misused when he was at Alabama. You know, I went back and watched his Alabama film, and you know, he was basically taking a series of flat passes, yeah. you, know, you know, from uh, who's the guy, uh, Jalen Hurts. You know, he barely ran any routes, I thought. And, and he came to D.C., and it was obvious immediately to me that the pro coaching just did him wonders, and it opened up his game tremendously from what he had at Alabama. I Honestly, I, you know, if you wanted to gamble, if Josh Doxson doesn't work out, I think Cam Sims is your ex-receiver in waiting. 
you you could say that uh, uh, Robert Davis has the size for it as well, and they've kept him around um, for for quite a while. From what was he a seventh round pick a few years ago? And they I think it was around. six. Yeah, maybe six, six round. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and and I mean Gruden kept going on about his size and his speed to his first year. And he's pretty and raw though to me. His right route running needed help. Sure. Um. Yeah. He he and I mean we've hardly seen much of him because of the injuries as well. So. Um, and uh, I would think Cam Sims elevated himself ahead of Robert Davis, but um, I, the, those two you'd feel good about. Maurice Harris has been a, a good, solid receiver, so I think they have depth there. Harris is a free agent though this year. I would imagine he'd be someone they'd look to bring back, and I don't think he would cost the world. Um, well, so that and he's a restricted free agent, so really, I mean, they'd have to not want him for him to yeah, not be back. Exactly, and I would think they'd want him back. So. I think they have a lot of depth guys there, and I think the Z position is set with Richardson. I think your slot position, the Zebra, is either Crowder or Quinn, uh, preferably Crowder, but Quinn's not a bad fallback option. Um, and you've got Harris as a guy that could be back up. I think the question is at X, and it's whether you think Josh Doxon showed enough progression that you stick with him at X, or do you go into the draft go, or even in free agency you go there, if there's a guy if there's a, a Julio Jones type a guy that you know he's going to be dominant he's the guy then you go get him and you say we've had enough of the Josh Dotson experiment and we'll, we'll let him compete for snaps behind Richardson and whoever this other guy is if you can find that guy fine I, I think you've had uh, Dotson's had long enough but if there's not that guy that you are certain about, if it's not a Julio Jones type or, um, you know, an Antonio Brown type, a guy that can be a legit sort of 10, f- 12 target a game guy, um, then I I think you might be fine sticking off, sticking with Docs and seeing if he can continue that development where he was more physical and see if you can get him the ball more and, and see if you can find a quarterback that can make use of that. Um, that vertical skill set that he has. Well, it's funny you mention this because a guy I've been drooling over draft-wise is is uh, uh, Brown from um, uh, from Brown. Oklahoma. Yeah, Marquise Brown. Thank you from Oklahoma. You know that kid is a playmaker, which is something I think the Redskins desperately need. Um, what are your thoughts on him and the other, generally speaking, the wide receiver class? There's a bunch of X, you know, X receiver prospects. I yeah. Think in this class. So for Brown, I see him more of a Z. I see him more of being a guy that's like Richardson uh, and, and Deshaun Jackson. That that's the the speedsters that can take the top off the defense. They tend to be the Z in this offense. Um, and could you play either Richardson or Brown at the X? Yeah, you probably could put Richardson there, um, and yeah, you could make a spot for Brown as the Z. Um, I, I I personally am pretty. Ha- I really liked what we I saw from Richardson on film last year, even though it, the numbers probably didn't suggest he did particularly well. I I I really liked what I saw from him, and I think there's plenty of potential there, assuming he can stay healthy. Um, which I feel like we've said a lot of about a lot of players, assuming they can <laughs> stay healthy. Um, and so that's a big assumption. But they, yes, and they usually have not. <laughs> yes, I know. Um, but. Uh, I really like what I've seen from Richardson. I think he can be the guy at the Z. Um, Brown uh, Brown is a tremendous player. I've been watching a ton of Kyler Murray, and literally every every game, Marquise Brown makes one of these plays where it's like a 12-yard hook route over the middle. He catches the ball, and suddenly he takes he's off. Gone. And yeah, he's gone. He's it's, gone. It's it's yeah. absurd. So, yes, he's a really, really good receiver, and you could fiddle guys around. You could probably put Richardson at the X, but the X is kind of the bigger body type. Think of Pierre Garçon type, the bigger body, the um, the thicker guy that can take more of a pounding from from taking those little three step slants and and the little quick hitches that on third and four you want a quick hitch and make a catch. Um, contested catch. That's the kind of guy that I'm talking about for an X. Well, let me throw a, a name at you then. Uh, DK Metcalf from Ole Miss, the guy who looked like he was the Incredible Hulk in the photo that <laughs> yeah. came out this, right, this week. Weird. Yes, uh, he's not someone I've got around to studying a great deal of yet, um, and I do intend to, um, and he could well be that guy. From what I've read from other people that I I respect and and trust, he is that guy, and if there is no other option at 15, um, I I feel like 
a, a, a safety or a corner would probably be a bigger need. But if uh, and I haven't really got into the draft stuff with those guys yet. So I, I sure you you could absolutely make the argument for a receiver. And if you think uh, Metcalf, I, I can't remember. His yeah, name, Metcalf. Metcalf. DK Metcalf. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you, if you think he can be that guy, absolutely. And you know he has that frame for it. Um, he, he he from the little bits I've seen of him, he is strong as an ox, and he can take off like the wind. So. He, he seems like the kind of guy that could be the X, and that is certainly the profile of a receiver that you want to be an X. So if, yeah. if, if you think he's that guy, absolutely, you, you take him, and, and then you say, yes, the Josh Stocks near is over. But if he if it's not him, or if it's not a, I keep going back to a Julio Jones type, a, you know, the big body, or, or an AJ Green type, then I think you go you keep going with Josh Stocks. I mean, and the other guys, you know, I think it would fit that mold be, would maybe be Nikhil Harry from Arizona State. You know, a lot of people are high on Debo Samuel. It's a little small, a little smaller than yeah. those other guys. Yeah, for sure. I, I've seen a little bit of Samuels, and and I, he's more of a, a, a Z type or even a slot. Yeah. Um, so. Um. Uh, yeah. Let, sure, let's I move think on. Metcalf and uh, Cam Sims work out pretty well, though. So that works. I mean, we have the tallest him, wide receiver group ever. You know, with those still two guys. Dynamic. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, let's move on here because um, we could. I think we could probably talk about wide receivers all day. Um, the the left guard position with the Redskins has become, I, I mean, almost a running joke. Yeah. Um, okay. F- f- number one question is, and fans are going to hate me for saying this, and you know, sorry. Should Sean Laval be brought back again? <laughs> uh you know, the thing I've always said about Laval is when he's healthy, he's played fine. Um, he's never healthy. So, you know, he, he's healthy for a game or two, and then he picks up an injury, and when he gets when he picks up an injury, I don't want to say he's a liability, because that's harsh on him, but he, he, he easily becomes the worst member on the offensive line, um, and he desperately needs upgrading if he's constantly playing with injury, and he's not getting any younger... So I would say it's probably time to move on from the vow. I would put a caveat on that. If you need a backup, if the vow is strictly as a backup option, um, because you know the team needs depth given the number of injuries they've had, if the vow is their backup swing guard going into the next season, I'd be fine with that. I wouldn't want him to be the guy that I'm relying on to be the starter for the next 16 games. Have any names? Who would you like to see? Um, you know, I, I yeah, it's really really <laughs> tough because they they putting you on the spot. The best offensive linemen don't tend to become free agents. I really liked what I saw from Jonathan Cooper, but the thing, the story on Cooper has been and throughout his career has been that mm-hmm. he can't stay healthy exactly, and that's just constantly what they've had on the offensive line. Um, so. You know, you, I, I think you'd bring him back. I don't, I don't see why you wouldn't bring him back. But he's, he, is he the next Sean Laval, where he's good for a few games and then he gets injured and you, you're looking for another guy off the street? I don't know. Answer, answer, yes. <laughs> so, I'm to save you the trouble. Um, I, w- I would certainly bring back Jonathan Cooper, and I think he would have the inside slant on getting that starting job. Um, but I, I don't know if there's a great deal of. You know, free agents that I'm going, yeah, bring bring them in. I'm I'm not pounding the table for anyone for a left guard. I I like the top of the range guys. You're looking at Roger Saffold from the Rams in a similar offense, but he's going to be getting far more money than the Redskins can afford. Especially, you know, they've got Brandon Sheriff to extend as well. So I, hey, there's a good number of fans out there who who continually pound us with Cody Ford and move him inside from where he played at Oklahoma. Well. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to, if you want to do that kind of thing, you could. You could look at a tackle that you could move inside. You could look at. Um, I'm sure there's options in the draft. Uh, it, it's a tough one because you know they spent recent draft picks on on the offensive line, and it, I don't want to say like you, you can never spend too many draft picks on the offensive line, but there's at a certain point you need to also address other positions um, yeah. and. And when, you, when you've spent a first-round pick and it being... Like, they've got, what, two first-round picks on the offensive line. They've got... Uh, in and Sheriff, a third. And a third-round third third pick. In yeah. Morgan Moses. They, they've got... They can't afford to have 
five first round picks on the offensive line. I think so. a lot of people don't understand the concept of of percentage cap. You know, you know, the Redskins cannot, and no team is going to spend a in a in in inordinate amount of money on one position group and throw the whole salary cap out of whack. This is why they can't bring in a guy like Nick Foles, a quarterback. Well, it's because you can't have 20% of your cap spent on quarterbacking. And so I think what you're getting at, Mark, is that if we have a whole bunch of number one picks on the offensive line, we're going to have the most expensive offensive line in history, and we'll have no playmakers. Exactly. That's the way I look at it. Yes, exactly. And you're looking at a similar situation to what Dallas were in, where they have a great offensive line. Um, but they lose Ezekiel Elliott, and then suddenly they've got no receivers for Dak to yeah. throw to, and then they have to go and make the big move for Cooper. So, um, yeah, that's that's exactly what I'm, to- I'm talking about. I think left guard is a spot that either sort of a mid-round pick, and I'm talking third at the most, probably a fourth or later, that a guy that you can develop into it, um, and I think you go with like Jonathan Cooper and, and hope that he stays healthy and develops <laughs> someone behind him. And no, I'm not laughing no at your thought. I'm laughing. Lyman. No swing lineman, because this is, I don't, we, we can't speak much right now on Christian, but good Lord, like we don't, we don't need to uh, afford that. Let's get a, yeah. a, a, a experienced collegiate guard, interior offensive lineman, and put that man at left guard, or at least back, have him back up the starting uh, 2019 guard so he can be ready just in case anything happens. Swing, swing offensive lineman is not going to be. Uh, acceptable this offseason. Can't do it. I, I, we need to move on from this too, but it, Jerron Christian didn't show much nope. you know, to me. I don't know why they drafted him, quite honestly. Am I wrong? It uh, sounds like I'm not. You're, well, I mean, he showed nothing during the season. Well, yeah. he showed worse than nothing during the season. But, he was um, terrible. Yeah. He was, but we we said the same about Morgan Moses after his rookie year. Um, and he yeah, that's exactly okay. That's the the thing with Christian is he's an incredible athlete, but he lacks playing strength. And like he in college he was like what two ninety, and you want a tackle to be sort of two ten, uh, sorry three ten. So um, he he lacked play strength, and that showed on film. Like the Falcons game, he got completely bulldozed over by a very easy rush. Um, so uh, Christian incredibly athletic, and he definitely was taken as a project um, because of his quickness. That can that can be an elite trait for an offensive lineman. But it's a hell of a project when you're spending a third round pick on a project. It, it is, and and he probably was overdrafted for for the the talent that he was. But yeah, he um, he is a long term guy. Less, you know, to to me the most controversial group on on the offense is the tight end group, and, yep. and the reason being is, you know, I thought Vernon Davis looked a bit old. Last year, you know, Jordan Reed is the obvious health problem. This is a group they have a ton of money spent on it. Um, I guess my question, I advocated on this show and in print that they ought to cut Reed and Davis both and move on and draft somebody. So just talk to us a little bit about what you saw in the tight end group and what your thoughts are about the future of that group. So I will stand on the table and not let Jordan Reed go. Um, That's one thing I will say. Um, I, I completely understand the frustration with, he never stays healthy. He only plays 10 to 12 games a year. I totally get that. I will argue back to you that what he brings in those 10 to 12 games of the year, cons- it, assuming that he's used correctly, and he's not always been used correctly, and they've la- sometimes they've gone away from him and they've tried to get too cute and been like, well, we've gone to him in the first half, they're going to adjust to take him away, and so they don't go to him in the second half. Ignoring all that, he's still their best playmaker with the ball in his hand. I don't think they can let that go considering we've just talked about like I'm higher on the receiver group position than everyone else it seems to be um, but most people seem to think they lack playmakers and they need a number one receiver so why are they letting go of their best receiver in Jordan Reed I'm, there's no way I'm letting Reed go I still think he's the key to their offense um, Vernon Davis is a completely different thing I agree with you he showed up as he, he showed his age a little bit um, and certainly as a blocker they, they need that second guy when Jordan reads your number one tight end, you need the second guy to be able to block. And Vernon Davis could not block uh, at all last season. And it showed up in the running game. It really hurt their running game. And it was, if it wasn't for Adrian Peterson making some outstanding cuts, they they would have had a lot more troubles in the running game than they did. Um, so I, and with Vernon Davis's cap hit, I, I'm sure you know it. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it is. I think it's five or six million. I can't remember how much exactly they can save. But 
that's someone I would be moving on from. And if he wants to come back on a very cheap, like I'm talking minimum vet deal, then sure, have him back for a locker room influence. But I'm yeah, it's it's six point three million is his cap hit. So yeah, you definitely move on. I'm um, speaking of moving on. We're burning through our time rapidly. We've got lots more to cover with you. So sure. let's switch over to the other side of the ball and on defense. And let's start with the inside linebacker group. You know, and, and the reason I want to start there is um, I think that's the group that needs the most help. Um, my question to you really is: Should the Redskins move on from Mason Foster and Zach Brown? Both, none, or one or the other? Uh, it's difficult because I like both players. I see what Mason Foster brings to the team in terms of... I do um, too. I want to put that out there. I, he, I do too. Yes, I, I see what he brings to the team. He's, he's a strong run defender. He gets them on the, the same page, um, even though they did have some coverage busts this year. I, I, I agree with that. Um, and, you know, he does get targeted in coverage a fair amount. In zone coverage, he's better than what he's given credit for. Um, and as a run defender, he's he's still one of their better run defenders as a linebacker. Yeah. I I can understand them wanting to be more athletic at that position. Uh, that I think that's a big part of why they went and got Ruben Foster. Um, and whatever you think about that, will 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 go on from that. But um, I I I don't. I think Foster is a good player. I think he has a posi- a place in this league on a team. I'm I'm not sure if the Redskins should stick with him. Um, uh, I think they will probably move on. Um, And I'm leaning towards I would move on as well, but I'm not like, definitely we have to cut him. Um, Who who else do you think are your uh, potential cuts on defense? uh, Who do you think they ought to get rid of? Well, the obvious ones are, you know... I guess Foster Brown, although I they seem to want to move on from Zach Brown. I wouldn't move on from Zach Brown. I don't know why. He's he... kind of making a nuisance of himself, you know, per, from a personality standpoint. Sure, wise. yeah. Um, but you know, when he's your best linebacker, he uh, well, I guess he can't afford to do that because they're talking about cutting him or, or what have <laughs> But uh, it, like you, you give you make exceptions for guys that are your better players, um, and I guess they they feel like they want to move on from him and they want to go with these Bama guys as their linebackers, but I still think he's their best linebacker and I think he's better in coverage than they gave credit for. Like, Zach Brown's role, for me, was so weird. They started the year as they didn't trust him on third down, they didn't trust him in coverage, and then, uh, so he only played first and second down, and then they replaced him on first and second down with Sean Dion Hamilton, but they still wanted to give him playing time, so on third down, he came on the field for Sean Dion Hamilton and he kept... Um, Josh Harvey Clemens off the field, who is their coverage guy. So I, I didn't, either. I I didn't under, <laughs> I do not understand what their pecking order was at linebacker. I really don't. But, I also don't know whether Sean Dion Hamilton isn't a better Mike backer and not that weak side backside yes, backer. I would agree with that. I think that is his long term role is probably as a Mike, and I think my guess would be this is totally like not any sort of inside information but my total guess would be that they see they they're recreating that band front they're going with Sean Dion Hamilton as their mic and uh Ruben Foster as their mo um which is kind of the the weak side guy um who who cleans up and, and Dion Hamilton runs the show and and frees up Foster Ruben Foster to clean up for them um i, I that's how i think they're going to go I um, I don't like how, and because you had brought up Harvey Clemens, I just I just don't like how they they just stripped him uh, from you know a role that was really good for him um, over time. Like it last year, uh, and excuse me, in 2017, uh, as the season went on towards the end of the season, he got a little bit more playing time. I just you just knew what he was capable of. I mean, even in the preseason that year, you saw you know the things that he was capable of, and I would I would just be so confused like why. Did they get so carried away with, you know, the top end when they had somebody whose role was always, you know, he was consistent in his role. Obviously, he's young. He has more to learn, but he was still consistent and growing in something. And they, they kind of somewhat took that away from getting getting uh, too too far carried away in Foster and uh, Deion Hamilton and, and Jack Brown and all that mess. Yeah, I didn't understand that either. As I said, that, that whole inside linebacker spot got so messed up. And they had the established 
roles at the start of the year, and that was working. And then they they got they didn't like Zach Brown for whatever reason. Maybe he was too loud and too noisy on Twitter or what have you. Frustrating, man. Because they they had pieces. Yeah, they had some pieces. Um, and you know they they decided to screw all up. But I I I just didn't understand why. If you're gonna remove Zach Brown for what he said on Twitter, why are you not taking him off the field completely rather than replacing what? I think Zach Brown has a role to play. I think you know, he's Zach their Brown best does... linebacker. So if they, I, I know he's not him, good in coverage to me, you know, but he's he's a great pursuit, you know, Buck, you know, style yeah, linebacker. He's their, he's their most athletic guy, and he's better in yeah. coverage than what he's given credit for. He, sometimes he 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 doesn't have the necessarily the best instincts in zone. But he's got the athleticism to stay with guys in man. He's kind of the opposite of Mason Foster in that. That's to me. That's you just said the problem with him. You know, is I don't think he's very good in zone. It's not like he doesn't know really where to where he's supposed to be and what he's supposed to look at. And he's very athletic, but he just can't make up ground when he's totally out of position. Yeah, well, and they they run a lot of pattern matching stuff, which is which can be complex and and tough to get your head around sometimes. Um, so I do understand that, but. I I still think he's their best linebacker currently, and and uh, unless if if their problem with him was the stuff that he said on on Twitter or off the field issues, don't play him at all. Don't you know relegate him to a role that doesn't necessarily suit him. Either play him and say he's our best guy, we're playing him, or don't play him at all. Don't go so kind of halfway in between. That's so nice. I, yeah, and at this point, to be honest with you, given the mess that they're in. Uh, I feel like the best thing would be addition. Well, not even addition. I'm sorry. Just if you if you have less, you can do more. Um, or you just do more with less. Like if you if you simply have your two or three, uh, maybe four linebackers that you're, you're you plan on using. Um, you just keep those and move on and implement them every single game and, and every single game plan. So, uh, it's it's just it's too much carousel, too much things going on. Uh, and you have potential from pretty much. Each linebacker that you have, you have potential in them if, if you use them properly, whatever role that you see fit. But um, I guess that's one thing that uh, Rob Ryan will, will try and figure out. I mean, we don't know much with him as a positions coach, but um, I, I hope he can sort it out because at this point, you can't just keep losing people in the in the, the carousel that you that you had <laughs> last year. It's, it's just not worth it. Just keep stick to three or four linebackers and just move on. Yep, I agree. All right, we we can't leave linebackers without going over Reuben Foster a little bit and seeing your thoughts on him. And now with this, the caveat to Reuben Foster is that he's still probably going to get going to get suspended. That's a whole nother discussion, you know, that we can we'll avoid since we have Mark here on the on the show. But from an X's and O's standpoint, assuming he plays at least at some point, what does Reuben Foster bring that maybe these other guys don't bring? Yeah, the the question with Foster has never been his ability on the field. He's always been a, a top prospects on the field and uh, I I would state that like I think my opinion on the signing of Foster and what have you is is pretty well known and public on Twitter so yeah, go ahead well, so go ahead and say it I wasn't trying to avoid it well yeah it was it's just that like I I didn't understand why they rushed out to get him um like you mean why can I be blunt and blunter than Mark will be because Mark has a real job and we don't I mean why why are you bringing a guy who's a wreck of a human being and who's accused of domestic violence and why are you standing up and being the first one to bring a guy like in when there was no rush yes that's what I've said about it that that's exactly where I stand uh, but I wasn't going to say that that bluntly um <laughs> you you can't say it that bluntly <laughs> but I can yeah so um. Yeah, so that's that's how I feel about him off the field, um, and I don't want to be like the the kind of guy that's like, well, off the field, whatever. On the field, he's really good, um, but as you're asking from a strictly on the field perspective, yeah, he's a good player. Um, he, he's ridiculously athletic. He can cover. He can run and tackle. Um, he's he's not quite a Mike in in that he doesn't. He's not the first guy you want going in. He, he, well, do you think he's more of a buck, you know, yeah, he, he's, backer? Yeah, he's the guy, the, the, the Redskins would call it a mo. They, they, the, a in mo, the, okay. In the 3-4, you'd have the outside linebackers as the Will and the Sam. You have the inside backers as the Mike and the Mo. And the Mike is the strong side guy. He's the typical guy with the, making the calls and stuff. And that's Yeah, the, I think I'm saying the same thing. I think I'm just using maybe wrong terminology. But So you, yeah, the know, backside you know, pursuit guy exactly. is really what... Yeah, that, that is what Foster is, I think. Um, and, and 
th- that would be the role I think he'd play alongside Sean Dion Hamilton like he did at Alabama, and he'd be the cleanup guy. Um, and much like what they had last year with Mason Foster and um, with Zach Brown, where Mason Foster would be the mic and he'd be the guy that goes in first, and that clears up the lane for Brown, the, the more athletic guy, to get a free run in and go make the play. Um, we, and, we just need to draft another Bama edge rush, and we'll have a complete yeah, Alabama front, front seven. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you if you want an inside linebacker that's a free agent from Bama, you can get uh, what's his name, uh, C.J. Mosley from the Ravens. He's yeah. a free agent. Uh, he's another a, guy who's got some off the field issues. Yeah, there, there's another. I wonder, another what, I wonder what college you went. Exactly, I was about to say it. <laughs> <laughs> so Alabama. Yeah, that that Ruben Foster on the field is a good player, but I I I don't want to be the guy that kind of brushes. The away the stuff off the field so I, I, i'm totally I, with you i just crazy uh, you know but just from an on the field standpoint that was what i was talking about yeah. um and from a legal perspective just incidentally you know, i don't know if we've addressed this on the show um yes the criminal case was dismissed no that matters not one whit when it comes to how the nfl views the matter the nfl will do an independent investigation um the standard of proof in a criminal case in the United States, you know, Marcus Britton is British. Uh, the standard of proof in a criminal case is a whole lot higher than the collective bargaining agreement mandates. And so it's entirely possible that he gets suspended anyway. And the basic gist of what the NFL uh, will look at is, did he hit her? Do they think he hit this woman or not? It doesn't matter what the circumstances are, basically, for the NFL. If he hit her, he's going to get suspended, and that's probably the end of the story. Right. So that's just briefly. Um, okay, so... Um, Defensive backfield wise, we have not done defensive backfield on our def- on our uh, position group breakdowns here yet, so this is going to count for that. Um, let's start with the corner group. You know, we've got Josh Norman. You know, fan unfavorite Josh Norman. Um, obviously, he's the high high paid guy. We have the injured Quentin Dunbar on the other side. Um, your thoughts on the starting on the two starters there? at the number one and number two corner position. And in addition, just uh, your your overall assessment of the group itself, um, but yeah, primarily those two. Well. Sure. So Josh Norman, I think, gets a lot of unfair stick from fans. I think he's a generally a good player. Yes, he hasn't lived up to the ridiculous contract he was given. That's like the, the money side of things gets far too blown out of proportion. It's whoever is the most recent corner is the highest paid corner. Whoever's the most recent paid quarterback is the highest paid quarterback. That's just the way it works. Um, he sure. No, I mean, nobody's worth the $75 million contract he was given. Let, let's just be frank about that. I'd be, I'd be worth it if the Redskins were only giving <laughs> me that contract. I mean, I'd take it, but I certainly wouldn't be worth it. So, um, it, on the field, yeah, it, like, all corners get burnt. He's not what people think of when they think of a shutdown corner. They, they, they think of what Darrell Rebus was for a few years, where he literally followed receivers around and he jammed them at the line of scrimmage and he stopped them getting open. That's never been Josh Norman's style of game. And, you know, he's adapted to that and and he's added that to his game, I think, since he's come to the Redskins. So I I, I think he's actually improved in that manner. Um, he's always been more of a off corner that can play with vision and when he plays with vision, he can shut down a side of the field. Um, and, and he could break on the ball and yes he will get burnt from time to time all cornerbacks do um, but I, I, in general I think he's been, been good um, and and you know the some of the plays he made I think the, the interception against Tampa Bay like that's a play designed to make him draw it was a sail route um, to the running back um, and it's a very popular concept in the NFL right now and nobody's been able to stop it and it was a play designed for the deep post from Jackson to take Josh Norman inside and open up uh, a deep corner route from the running back. And Josh Norman got eyes on it late, saw it, and broke on it and made an exception when it should have been a touchdown. So he's he's making good plays. Um, it's just it, at his age, are they are they is he doing enough for them to justify that? As we talked about earlier, the the pe- uh, proportion of the cap. Well, from my perspective on this is, for those of you out there who are listening who want the Redskins to cut Josh Norman, who do you think is going to replace him? That's, who, you, yeah. Are you going to put Greg Stroman in there as, you know, the number one pick? You know, Adonis Alexander, who didn't play much. You know, you have to – teams aren't dumb enough to just cut players without a replacement lined up, and you have nobody who is a starting quality corner, I would argue. Uh, maybe, obviously, Fuller, you know, I guess would be – 
or not Fuller, the kid from uh, UCLA helped me. Moreau. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Moreau. Fabian Moreau. Yeah. I mean, but I didn't think he was all that good last year. So to me, you cut um, Josh Norman and you've got um, all of a sudden you've created a major hole. Yeah, I, I would agree with that as well. I, I think there, when you when you're talking about cutting Norman, yes, it would be nice to save the cap room, um, especially with the Smith injury in the quarterback situation. But you're then leaving yourself very short at corner. Um, and Dunbar, I thought, did really well at the start of the year. Like for the first few games before he got hurt, I think I thought he was the best corner on this team, maybe the best defensive back. Um, Swearinger was slightly better as in terms of defensive back, but Dunbar was very playing at a very high level. Um, now he has that nerve injury, which are always dodgy, and you it's never weird. know. You never know when that's gonna. I mean, get back. you know, the injury report said shin for weeks, yeah, and then we hear it's a nerve injury in his shin, and you know, I don't think they really meant that. What they're talking about is nerve, a nerve injury in his lower leg, mm. and that never really recovered. You know, or, or you know, in weeks and weeks and weeks, I, I'm legitimately concerned about Quentin Dunbar's status. I would be as well. Um, uh, the encouraging part is that he did make it back on the field later in the season, uh, albeit briefly. Um, he did make it back on the field, so there is some encouragement there that he can make it make back. And I think at the end of the year in the exit interviews, he he was saying that he's pretty optimistic that he will fully recover. And Jay Gruden said the same thing. Um, and whether that's just talk or whatever, I don't know. Um, and we heard the same thing with Kaishan Jarrett. For yes, a while. I, I I do know that. Um, and hopefully it's not another Jarrett situation. But Dunbar, I, I thought was a very very good corner and, and had had a shot to be a, a not necessarily a number one, possibly a number one, if not a very good number two. Um, and if, if you could guarantee his health and you could move him over as the number one, then maybe you talk about cutting Norm. Because um, after that, you're right. Fabian Moreau, I didn't think much of as a slot corner. I, I know Chris Cooley on his podcasts and what have you um, spoke highly of Moreau as an outside corner, and he did show more potential there. And that's what he played in college, um, and that's where yeah. he, he can play um, with um, his, his more athleticism and, and and being able to recover deep and what have you, where he's only got to protect. He's got the sideline to help him. Um, so maybe you can transition him to outside, but he's not someone that I'm thinking I want starting personally. Um, I would take Chris Cooley's word over mine, but I, I personally, now what does Cooley know? I mean, Chris Cooley, <laughs> who's he? So I think he plays football. To be honest with you, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I personally don't see him as the guy that I want starting outside corner next year. Um, maybe as a project, but. I, I, yeah, it's a big risk. It's a, you know, and then we've got guys like Greg Stroman. You know, he was a fan favorite because of you know he went to Virginia Tech. Yeah, uh, I thought he had a long way to go to show any confidence at all. Totally at agree. In, yeah, yeah. You know, and some of these other guys. I mean, you know, there's a lot of just the guys out there. I think. Yeah. You know, Danny Johnson all, undrafted. Like they, they have guys that if you had, if you had the top of the roster guys, if you had Bashaw Breeden back. And you had Breland and Norman as your starters, and Dunbar as your third, like they had last year. Then you could have the Strowmans and your Danny Johnsons and Adonis Alexander as your as your backup guys, and and your favorite Moreaus as the developmental guys. But they don't have the guys that they can rely on at the top um, to allow those guys time to develop. And as we saw this year, they got thrown out on, into the deep end, and and didn't it, go well. It, it did not go well for them. So. Yeah, now, it's a thin position corner. I think we have the opposite problem with the safety group. And, you know, we've got a whole bunch of corners. You know, well, in the safety group, we have literally none. Yes. You know, just about literally nobody. We've got DeShazer Revert. Two. Uh, and we've got Troy Apke, who was on Three, IR. <laughs> yeah, and then we've got, Monte. you know, the genius out there, Monte, who may or may not be eligible for a portion of next year. So I think they desperately need help at safety. I agree. Um, yeah, DJ Swearinger got himself cut. I understand why, you know, now they have to move on. So I guess the first question for you is, uh, basically out of a total lack of anybody else, can DeShager Everett actually be a starter, and is he more of a free or a strong? Uh <laughs> Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> you don't you don't have to be nice. Just say it. Like, I mean, the position group has been completely decimated. It's so frustrating because at the start of the year, it looked like they had 
their it position. like they had too many, and you were wondering why they drafted Apke. Yeah, that's what I thought. They had they had the starter set. They had Swearinger at strong. They had Monte Nicholson as the free, and that was their they they were fine. Um, they were really good. It was a position of strength, and suddenly over a season, you know, they traded for Clinton Dix. They cut Swearinger. I still hate that they cut Swearinger. I do understand that uh, you know, like, mouth off too much. Mouth off and all of that. Yeah, yeah. But like, th- he was still their best. I would argue he was their best defensive player. Um, it's certainly their best defensive back. Um, and so, the, and and at a position where they couldn't afford to lose a guy, you know. So, yeah, it's a tough position. I I don't like the idea of Shazer ever at starting. Um, he's, I think he's more of a strong safety than a free, but I also don't trust him from a size perspective in the box uh, it, over a course of 16 games. Uh, We'd be remiss in not talking about uh, Haha Clinton Dix. I think he obviously took too many games, maybe too long to really get integrated in the offense, but by the end of the season, I thought he was playing pretty well. Um, I did our a uh, breakdown of the safety free agent class this past week. It's on our website if you haven't read it yet. And if once you get past Landon Collins, who would be great but isn't a Redskin, and he's really more of a strong safety anyway, um, you get to looking at the list, and Clinton Dix may be, um, weirdly enough, maybe the best safety they could possibly bring back, who's a realistic option. Yeah, well, it depends what you're looking for. It, it, and I think a lot of it depends on the future of Monte Nicholson, whether they think that he's not going to be suspended and they think, like when they traded for Clinton Dix, they sort of served up this thing of oh, well, it's going to be a three safety rotation, which never really was going to work out because none of those guys covers the slot. And if you're going to go with three safeties, you need one of them to be able to cover the slot. Um, mm-hmm. And and none of them did that, so um, it was never really going to be that. And and it turned out it was just a straight swap. Clinton Dix went in for Monte Nicholson, and that that for me was a big turning point in the season for their defense. Um, but that's a bigger story. Um, with with Monte, if if he can come back and he can get back on track, I think he can be. He, he has the range at free safety, and he showed signs of developing when they expanded his role at the start of the year and and playing a little bit more man coverage and rolling down into the box. I still would prefer to just kind of leave him at free and in the kind of an Earl Thomas role as as the center fielder and and you know just take away the post um, and stay on top of things. I I think that's his best role. With his range, he's, it's absurd. He can get from the middle of the field to the sideline in a blink, and that that is a, an elite trait that you don't get very often. So if they can, if he, you know, makes it back and isn't suspended, or and and that's a lot of ifs, and, and this whole thing has been a lot of ifs. Um, if if he can do that, then I think you can say you're okay at free safety, certainly from a starting perspective. Um, which would mean that you don't really need haha. Which would mean you don't really need haha Clinton Dix. But you know they they talked about how good he, of a locker room influence he was, and they have a infatuation with the Alabama guys right now. So you know <laughs> th- th- I wouldn't be surprised if they bring back Clinton Dix and and they went and s- tried to get Landon Collins as well, just to you know complete the Alabama set. Um, <laughs> Landon Collins is going to be one expensive dude though. That's yeah, a that's for sure. And and they'll you know, go broke for Alabama. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they probably will. You're probably right, Jamal. They probably would. I, I wouldn't. Be I, I want to see them have 11 Alabama starters. Million, That's no the goal. They, I mean, <laughs> they're getting there, man. They're getting there. You know, they're gonna have what? They're gonna have probably four, possibly five of Anderson steps. Yeah. Up. And then if you bring back Clinton Dix, that's six. And if you get a Collins, that's seven. You just need to draft a couple of Bama corners, and you're all right. You know, so uh, from, I can tell you from a from Monte Nicholson's standpoint, we haven't talked about him in a while. He's absolutely going to get suspended. Yeah. Uh, you know, he he's got uh, he has another DUI on his record. You know, if for those of you who don't know, because I did go research his background, and I went, I did go pull the uh, what the documents I could pull from the Ashburn um, District Clerk's office. So he he has a past. Uh, the incident in question, it's on video. He knocked a dude out. Um, he's going to get suspended. There's no doubt about it. The baseline in these things is usually six games. They they will probably adjust it down, but because he's basically a second offender even though the DUI probably counted against him in the uh, in the drug of abuse policy mm. you know it, they, it's because that's where alcohol would go I would assume he's probably in phase one of the drug program already because of the DUI so he's going to get suspended I would assume he's probably going to get three or four games 
So that's Nicholson, and if that's the case, they need somebody to start the first quarter of the season at least. Yeah, um, and I, th- I I haven't gone too far into the draft with safeties yet. I, I, I know there's a couple free agents. There. Trey Boston would be a guy that I, I he could play that center field role. I, I studied safeties a few years ago for an NFL 1000 project, and Trey Boston was consistently one of the best pure free safeties. So if you're willing to have that kind of split where you have a free safety stay in the middle of the field, like Earl Thomas, like the Seahawks have, and you have a designated center fielder and a designated guy in the box. Trey Boston, I think, can be your center fielder. Um, it, the question is then, do you have a guy that you can trust in the box? And I don't think you can trust the Seahawks or Everett. I, I think Everett can be fine in coverage on a tight end, but is he a guy that you know can fill in on the run and make a tackle on a back that's 230 pounds? Like, I, no. If, if Derek, if Derek Henry is running up on him. I, I I think Derek Henry's gonna run well, Derek Henry's gonna run over most people, but I think he would certainly run over Everett. So um I I, I don't trust Everett to go and make a tackle on a guy if he's the free defender. Um and so that's why I think they would need a strong safety as well. Well, you make a good point about you know the the, the uh safety that can cover the slot, because I don't know if people realize this, but um, you know, when you've got and Mark knows this better than you know, better than I do, but when you've got multiple receivers on one side, you know, how you rotate his own coverage is, you know, the, the safety on the side in which you've got the twins is going to rotate down, you know, so you've got to have a safety who is capable of covering a little slot guy like Jameson Crowder, which means, you know, that he's got to have speed, but he's more importantly got to be able to, uh, I think, read the slot corners moves, be agile enough to stay with him because the slot corner can, or the slot receiver can, you know, break either direction. Yep. He can do a lot of things. And so I think you've got to have a guy who's athletic and talented in coverage to be able to fill that role. Yeah, well, that the thing with safeties is it, it people don't realize safety is such an underrated position in the NFL. It, it really dictates exactly the kind of coverages you can play. Um, and and the, style, the style of your defense really is revolved around your safeties. Um, and, you know, that Seattle defense worked so well because they had – Cam Chancellor was ridiculously good in the box, and Earl Thomas was ridiculously good as a center fielder, and they could stick to that, and that worked perfectly. Um, now the Redskins have tended to prefer th- when they had Nicholson and Swearinger uh, a few years, uh, yeah, last season, not this season, just gone the 2017. They stuck Swearinger, uh, they stuck Nicholson in center field, and they left Swearinger in the box, and that worked. Um, but this year they they wanted to do more pattern matching stuff. And that requires both safeties to be able to play both roles. Um, and Swearinger can do that. Monte Nicholson took some adjustment, and, and Clinton Dix did that at Alabama, but he also took some adjustment with the calls and learning the, the, the calls and the, the terminology that the Redskins run um, and, and had some issues with that. So uh, if, if you want a guy that can do that pattern matching stuff, then he needs to be, as you say, he needs to be versatile. He needs to be able to... W- rotate down and cover a slot um, and he needs to be able to play deep um, and when I look at the free agents, the, the guys that can do that are limited, I mean you look at LaMarcus Joyner for the, from the Rams, he can do that but he's going to get a big payday because he's coming off I think he got franchise tagged last year so he, he's coming off of yeah, he's not going anywhere, he's the other big name he's not going to go exactly. anywhere <laughs> and then, then you're looking at guys like Adrian Amos from the Bears and I, he's not someone that I was particularly high on um, you, you could George Iloka, possibly, but he's... Well, the good he thing is Tyron, Tyron Matthew was on a one-year deal in Houston. So. Ty, Tyron Matthew, yeah, uh, and but again, he's looking... He's going to be looking for a payday, so it's, it's again... That's it's, true. He really loves the Texans, though. He's come out and talked about mm-hmm. how much the Texans embrace, embraced him, um, how much he liked Houston. Houston seems to like him. And the other thing about him... I mean, I admire him endlessly for overcoming his drug addiction. So don't get me wrong, but I mean, he's the guy who needs marijuana. A, a, yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, he was clearly. A, I mean, he had a major drug problem. Yeah. Call it addiction. Call it whatever you want. But he had a major drug problem, and he overcame that. And I applaud him for it. But he's the type of guy who needs a solid support system around him. And given the mess that is the Redskins locker room, I'm not sure that that's really the right place for him. What do I know? But, I mean, that's that's my concern with Matthew. is isn't him personally. It's whether the Redskins are the right place to fully support a guy like that. Yeah, and possibly so. not. And, and you know, um, so it, it really, it's really tough for the safety position to I, – I think they either have to give a little bit and say, okay, we're going to stick to 
uh, a designated strong and free role and, and go with a guy that can stay in center field and a guy that can play in the box. And that's much easier to find, but that limits what they can do coverage-wise. And, and they like to do a lot of pattern matching, and, and it's kind of the Alabama scheme they kind of brought over. And if they want to do that, they need the guys that can do both roles, and those guys just aren't out there. Um, that, that's the kind of guy that you have to draft and develop and you have to spend high draft picks on and you know that's entirely possible to do um, and there you know there is a t high r highly rated Bama safety that I haven't really got the chance to study yet but it, it, are you willing to spend a, a first round pick on a safety I, I don't know it, safety is something that tends to not be valued that highly in the NFL um, for whatever reason even though I think it should be so you know, it's it's a tough spot that they're in, um, and I don't think they made it any easier themselves with with releasing Swearinger. Um, I, honestly, I would have gone with Swearinger over Minuski if that was the battle, but that's another story, I guess. Um, let's get it. It's a whole stuff. other podcast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, Mark. Uh, we you know we could do this all day long, but we've exhausted the time we have, unfortunately. So let's end it with this. Okay. Mark Bullock is the new GM of the Washington Redskins. We have the 2019 draft coming up. What would you do in round one? You know, is it Kyler Murray? I hope not. Is it some? Is is it? I'm not a Kyler Murray fan. You know, sue me. You're gonna not like uh, me then. <laughs> go ahead. You know, it's, what would you do? So uh, number one is is Kyler Murray your dude? Talk to us about Kyler Murray, and then I'm gonna debate you on it. And then it, who would you pick? I, Ky Kyler Murray is very much my guy. Um, and uh, the just admit it because he's not any taller than you, and that's the reason. Just admit it. <laughs> No, I, I think he's an incredible playmaker, um, I, and fr from studying him, I've, I've gone through four or five of his games now, and the height thing and the size thing is, uh, I understand the concern with it, and I understand the trend in the NFL is like quarterbacks under six foot don't tend to play out well, and quarterbacks that aren't 220 pounds or whatever, they don't tend to last. I totally get that. But I think you have to put the context of it. If if you watch him and you study him, how many times does his height and his size impact his play? I have studied him, by the way. I'm, I'm, I don't have I'm, your eye no, for this, sure but I've have. studied him. Yeah. yeah. And I think that I see what you see on film in that it works. Whatever he's doing at Oklahoma works. You know, he, he has the ability to move. And he has the ability to read the field and move at the same time. You know, and um, he doesn't take a lot of big hits, even though he runs a lot. He's hyper-athletic. He's, he's very accurate for the most part. Though I think there's times when in the mid-range – uh, he kind of loses it a little bit. Yeah, the ball can um, on him a little bit at times. And, that, and, yeah. and he gets a little bit out of whack with his footwork here and there. Um, and that... I, I went back to watch him this week, though, and here's my, here's my question. is I, I was really high on his film the first time I watched him. And I came back to him a few days ago, and what I saw in, was uh, Marquise Brown made a lot of plays for him, and he was throwing to a lot of wide-open receivers. Yeah. Uh... I, I, Marquise Brown certainly made a lot of plays for him. Um, I, I would say that th there's more credit due to Murray than possibly uh, is given to him for the deep balls to Marquise Brown. Because we saw the case a lot of the time with Sean Jackson and Washington. How many times did we see Kirk Cousins underthrow him or overthrow him? Or... A ton, all the time. Exactly. We saw Sean Jackson get missed a million times. How many times did you see Marquise Brown get missed by Kyler Murray? Like they uh, less, they, less. They, they hit yeah. constantly, and like yeah. the, the deep post over the middle, they hit that like at least once a game, and that is not something that's easy to do. Um, I just can't get past the fact that he's Tyrion Lannister's height, <laughs> and, and it's a major problem <laughs> the, for me. The, see, I would totally understand that if like I saw him getting the ball batted down every. I, and I know I saw I know that's up, but we're talking about the NFL and not the Big Twelve. I I, just, I have a hard time with that. We're running out of time here, Mark. Get, go us real quick. Um, at fifteen, who would you pick? If Kyler Murray's there, I'm taking Kyler Murray. Uh, if not, um, I, I'm looking possibly at the receiver we discussed earlier, Metcalf. I, I'd want to study him more. I haven't done a hell of a lot of studying on the draft outside of quarterback, so I'm totally honest. Uh, but Kyler Murray okay. is certainly my guy, and he'd be a guy. I would be willing to move up to draft. Uh, that, that's wow. that's how much I'm saying that I, I I think that highly of him. I really don't see the problem with the size. I, I as I said, like Drew Locke, I've watched him play Alabama, and he got more balls Oof. batted down at the line yeah. than in in the first quarter. You know who Drew Locke reminds me of is 
Donovan Donovan McNabb, not really in the style of, of play because he's not a runner, but Donovan McNabb was a guy who would make a fabulous throw and then throw it in the dirt. Yes. You know, and that's what Drew Locke oh, is. And so I so think people exciting. are going to – People are going to get enamored with – Drew Locke reminds me of Josh Allen yes, a little bit I in do. that he's got the arm from God. He fell out of the quarterback factory, you know. But I think he's just – he's got so many WTF plays out there that he really makes me nervous. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. And I actually liked Josh Allen last year more than I like Drew Locke this year. Um, yeah. it, it, like, he, he's got the arm, but, like, there's only so much the arm can, can take yeah, you. Kind of you got yeah. you got to have the rest of the game as well. Yeah. Jamal, you got anything else? Uh no no um I understand the people's uh you know opinion on taking a quarterback first round so I can't I don't disagree with it um outside of that I mean we appreciate you coming on Mark everything as usual is you know very detailed and ana- and analytical so you know I appreciate you coming on cool. yeah check Mark out at the Athletic uh every week he's writing something new I find I said the name right too this hey, time. Well done. Because <laughs> because when we brought Mark on right before we went on the air, I said it wrong, and he had to correct me for the hundredth time. <laughs> so, Mark, thanks very much for coming on. We appreciate it. We'll hope to have you on again soon. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, guys. All right, no problem. All right. And that's it for the long side for this week. We will be back next week with another exciting episode. So catch you guys later. <laughs>